Humongous Entertainment, a development studio created in 1992 by ex-LucasArts employees Ron Gilbert and Shelley Day. With an experienced crew having worked on classic point-and-click games such as Tales of Monkey Island and Maniac Mansion, Humongous made a name for itself creating dozens of beloved educational adventure games for kids. They made Putt-Putt the Purple Car, whose games definitely came out in the wrong order. They made the Freddy Fish games, where he and his friend Luther and Freddy is apparently a girl. Okay, I should have known this. They also had Spy Fox, a sort of James Bond for kids, which has a disappointingly non-zero amount of erotica made about it. But there was always one character that stood above all the others for me, and that character was... Fatty Bear. Fatty Bear's Birthday Surprise is the second video game made by Humongous Entertainment. Though the character was also used in the minigame compilation Fatty Bear's Fun Pack and the crossover spin-off, this video is not about Fatty Bear. I'm sorry. 20 years ago, this world was gifted with one of its most endearing and charming creations. And although me being born was pretty great, 26 days earlier we got something that is arguably even more valuable. Pajama Sam, No Need to Hide When It's Dark Outside was released on October 4th, 1996. It was an educational point-and-click adventure game aimed at kids whose goal was to teach them to confront their fears. The game turned out to be a hit with kids, and all of Humongous' series went on to sell a combined total of over 15 million units. The games were also pretty well received by parents, with the company earning over 245 educational awards for excellence. And I want you to consider just how impressive that actually is. Kids wanting to learn. That doesn't happen often. These weren't just your typical games you had to play at school during computer lab time on your... Macintoshes. This ain't no Sammy Science House, that was- that's a bad example, that was- I, I like that game. This ain't no Plumo at the Zoo, that is another bad example. Okay, um... This ain't no Math Circus 1 through 5, I am not helping myself here. Okay, let's think about it like this. Those games are fun, sure, but they always felt like learning. There's only so many times I can angle this cannon before getting bored. What is so different between a game like, say, Math Blasters and Pajama Sam? It's that Math Blasters makes no attempt at trying to hide what it is, and that's to its own disadvantage. Telling a kid to eat their broccoli because it's gonna make them big and strong, that's... It's a terrible idea, that's... why would that work? Kids do not invest for the long term. They have more immediate concerns. This type of behavior occurs in everyone, but it's especially prominent with kids. And I love kids, but they can be as dumb as bricks sometimes. My parents would agree. That's why you have to trick them. That broccoli they won't eat. Tell them that if they don't, a civil war will break out in their own body. This is why Math Blasters just doesn't work. It's too cut and dry. There is a clear correct answer to every problem, but you just have to know it. There's no satisfaction in having to answer 7 plus 9 and just guessing a different answer until you get it right. You either knew the answer or you didn't. But there is satisfaction in messing around with a hook and a winch to propel yourself in a minecart over a precarious lava-filled chasm. If you ask a kid to spell out a word and they get it wrong, they don't want to try again. They got it wrong. They're just going to get discouraged. But when giving up means that all weather in the world will be a disaster, a problem that they themselves caused, they want to fix that problem, and they're going to keep trying until they do. And that is the genius behind games like Pajama Sam. Now all of the Pajama Sam games are very distinct from one another. Each one tries to teach kids something different. In this video, I'll be covering the first game, No Need to Hide When It's Dark Outside, beautifully abbreviated as Ninithwido. The game begins with Sam's mom wishing him a good night's sleep, since this is the first night that Sam's gonna try sleeping with the lights out. Okay, Sam, you remember tonight's the night we go to sleep with the lights off? Don't worry about me, Mom. I'm ready. And I can put on my pajama Sam mask if I get scared. And already we can see just how relatable this scenario is to kids. I myself had a lot of trouble sleeping without a nightlight for years, and even then I needed my stuffed animals with me for a long time after that. Sam is understandably scared for someone his age, and decides that he isn't gonna wait around for darkness to come get him. He's going after darkness. At this point, we're already in control of the game, but before I move on, I feel like I do need to address the elephant in the room. This is a job for... Pajama Sam! We're playing as Bobby Hell! Here are all the jokes that I came up with. Okay, moving on. Sam makes up his mind to enter into his closet, but first, he's going to need his trusty flashlight, pajama man mask, and lunchbox. That's where the player comes in. Pajama Sam is a standard point and click game, and if you're not familiar with that type of game, it's essentially a genre primarily focused on puzzle solving, dialogue trees, and using items you collect by clicking around the environment. Sam's bedroom is a really straightforward but nonetheless effective tutorial. It doesn't tell the player anything beyond telling them to search for items, and even the smallest children will eventually stumble upon them by clicking randomly. And with that, 90% of the gameplay has been taught to the player. At this point, we're ready to step into the land of darkness, the main setting of the game. After a short jog through a pretty silly looking landscape, we get roped up by the TSA over here and we have our stuff stolen from us. Things aren't looking great for Sam. Not only is he trapped in a strange foreign nightmare land, but he's had his only weapons taken from him. Now it's up to you, the player, to help Sam find his things and confront darkness once and for all. So I don't know about you, but I love this premise. I love everything about it. Think of all the creative freedom you could have with an idea like that. I would die happy if I could just ask 
how they made this game. So I did. I was fortunate enough to get in contact with some of the people who worked at Humongous back in the day and was able to ask a few questions. These are conversations my inner child refuses to believe actually happened, despite everything else indicating that they did. By the way, all the people on screen here were super friendly and helpful, so make sure you let them know just how rad they are. Cool, thanks. Humongous games are developed from very simple core ideas, with the core idea of Pajama Sam coming from Ron Gilbert himself. He wanted to make a game about nightmares, a game about a boy who was scared, and after narrowing down the character design to a few different ideas, artist Raphael Colonzo's design for Pajama Sam was chosen. A core concept like this allows for a lot of freedom while still keeping a clear direction. A central narrative, world, and character elements had to be set, of course, but a lot of the development process at Humongous was very iterative, with artists and programmers being given small amounts of creative liberties on a regular basis, whether it be adding small minigames or little animations. In short, if the people making the game are having fun, chances are the game is going to be fun too. And if there is one common theme between all the conversations I had with the developers, working at Humongous was one hell of a party. Sam's games rarely venture far away from the well-established point-and-click gameplay elements, and nor should it have to. All the challenges in the game can be overcome by thinking through a puzzle, which is a good lesson to teach kids, since a lot of games back in the day prioritized combat and platforming as the only ways to solve a problem. Plus, if this section where you need to click in time with the swinging of the chandelier is any indication, it's probably for the best that this game avoided action-based gameplay. That's not to say that this game doesn't provide a neat little challenge outside of the main story, though. You also have a scavenger hunt to worry about. Chances are you'll end up clicking on at least one of the many socks hidden around the Land of Darkness. This will bring you to Sam's Laundry Hamper, allowing you to store up to 10 different pairs of socks. This scavenger hunt feature got expanded upon in later games, but it's hard to dislike the simplicity of just trying to track down some devilishly hidden socks. They're always randomized too, so it makes for a fun speedrunning challenge even when the game's main story has long since become too easy for you. In fact, the game's randomized elements don't stop there. For each of the three main items to collect, there are two different locations to find them in, as you can see on screen. It's highly unlikely you'll play the exact same scenario twice in a row, and that's without factoring in the socks. It's definitely this aspect that makes these games consistently feel as fresh as when I was a kid. Speaking of which, I straight up do not remember this room. Has this always been in the game? Is this witchcraft? Probably. Between the two available paths for each item, there's always very clearly an easy one and a hard one, and it may just be me trying to see a pattern where there isn't one, but the easier one always seemed like it occurred way more frequently. The flashlight in the mines path is one I barely even remember, and I restarted the game upwards of 10 times, and I still didn't get the invisibility potion path. The Land of Darkness is divided into three distinct areas, the docks, the mines, and Darkness' house. First, let's tackle the docks, since it's always the first place I head to when playing the game. The docks are a pretty important area since it's always where you get the oil that lets you into the mines, and it's the only one of the three areas that could potentially be hiding all three of Sam's lost items. It's here we meet Otto the boat who helps us get around the river. Some places of note include this rusty shack, the geyser area, a series of dank underwater caves, and a park where you can play the national sport of cheese and crackers. And lastly, you have a garden guarded by a metaphor that I'm probably looking way too deep into. It's here we meet a recurring character in the Pajama Sam series, our good friend the carrot. He's a revolutionist wearing our Pajama Man mask trying to free his captured care friends from the kitchen. A task that he achieves through song, no less. Hey guys, don't you see he's with me and you're free to go. This made him a memorable character to say the least. Overall, the docks are an ideal first area to showcase the game's strengths. Great characters with great voice acting, gorgeous detailed art, and simple puzzles to prepare young players for the more complex ones later. One of my favorite examples of the game teaching you a lesson without telling you it's a lesson actually happens in this area. Since about a third of the Land of Darkness is accessible only by boat, we need our Scandinavian boat friend Otto to help us out with that. The thing is, Otto is a dumbass. He's a wooden boat who thinks that wood can't float, because his friend sank once. Otto has terrible friends and should reconsider who he associates with. So here's the thing, we need to explore the river, but Otto is insistent that he's gonna sink. But players already know for a fact that wood does float. We pass by a floating piece of wood on the third screen of the game. Bam! Get that weak ass anecdotal evidence out of my face, Otto! Check out this repeatable experimental result! Yeah! Scientific method! Please vaccinate your children! Back to the point, wood floats. We can see it floating, and that's actually a really important life lesson the kids are being taught here. Just because someone tells you something is true, doesn't make it true. What Otto is doing here is the equivalent of sharing a sketchy Facebook article because their friend ensured them that it was legit. And the game never directly tells players to show Otto the wood plank, which makes the lesson stick with players even more. And the designers recognize this fact. Kids don't want to be lectured, they want to figure this stuff out on their own. This philosophy is contrasted very well by this wonderfully self-aware cutscene where Otto gives the players an over minute and a half long lecture on geysers. And although I now know more about geysers than I ever really wanted to, this cutscene highlights exactly what puts Humongous' games over almost any other educational game. Humongous never sacrifices gameplay just to teach a lesson. 
Next up are the mines, my personal favorite area in the entire game. Here we meet Chief, a friendly but admittedly pretty rusty miner. After giving him some of the oil we got earlier, he's ready to zoom around the pretty vast and probably not up to code mines. What I love about the mines is that 80% of the screens you see in it only last about 5 seconds each. You're racing around at breakneck speeds, pausing only for a second to allow you to choose which path you want to take. But if you don't make a choice in time, you'll get pushed down the default path, which will take you past the important areas like the mysterious one-way door, the water meter, and the gold mine. Being quick, however, sends you off in some pretty wild pathways revealing the locations of by far the hardest to find socks in the game. It's hard enough trying to grab the socks that you can see, but it's another story entirely trying to find the ones that blend in. In addition to having the most complex gameplay in the entire game, the reason I love this section so much is how detailed and imaginative the backgrounds are. You have dangerous looking drops, crazy camera angles, and some really stellar animation of Chief maneuvering his way through the lava filled caverns. You can tell a lot of thought went into the layout of the mines, and I especially love the shot where you can see the underground caves you saw with Otto earlier. It shouldn't need to be said, but the art in this game is downright gorgeous. As a big fan of cartoony art styles, this game is an absolute treat. I've always loved how Pajama Sam was much more whimsical than its comparatively more grounded counterparts. Whereas Spy Fox had a cool stylized art direction, the environments it was paired with were mainly just ordinary buildings. The one building in Pajama Sam 1? A treehouse mansion. You have so much more creative freedom when you ignore physics and just try to draw something that looks imposing and memorable. It's the trade-off of realism versus impact, and in a game like this, impact is all that matters. This approach is very apparent in the mines. Just look at all these shots. They really sell the land of darkness as a dangerous place, not to be messed with. The choice of colors in this game deserves some praise as well, with subdued blues and greens chosen for the cold and quiet docks area, and bright and bubbling oranges and reds for the fast and deadly minecart tracks. Here's a fun fact though, Pajama Sam was the first humongous game where the backgrounds weren't done by hand first and then scanned in. Instead, they were done using some tools like Deluxe Paint, and then ported over into some in-house art tools. Typically, the way things worked is you had one artist working on one background for one to two weeks before it was sent off to have some animations added to it. Now, background art is one thing, but a large part of the artwork in this game comes in the form of character animations. That means lots and lots of frames of Sam jumping into and out of scenery. Enters and exits like that typically took around a week to animate for a single room, and the artist would try and aim for around 10 frames a second. Sam doesn't just walk in and out of frame, he has a unique way of bouncing into an area just like a kid would. Given the age of the game, a little bit of pixelation in the characters isn't a huge deal, and the fluid animation more than makes up for that. If you know where to look, you can find early sketches of character animation loops and backgrounds that didn't even make it into the game, which really shows just how much laborious work was put into the art side of things. Now moving on to a slightly different subject, the game's music definitely deserves some recognition. The wide variety of musical styles in this game perfectly suits the game's diverse set of locations and story moments. The thing is, it manages to do all this without being overly serious or complex, and why should it? We're a kid in pajamas and a cape collecting socks. We don't need the soundtrack for Skyrim backing us up. I feel like this undermines my point a bit. The songs have a very Saturday morning cartoon vibe going on, which makes sense given Sam's love for the superhero Pajama Man. Everything sounds bouncy and relaxed, not creepy or spooky like you'd expect the songs to be. Even in what is supposed to be the scariest part of the game, you have muted trumpets going off in the background accompanied by a xylophone. One track, I swear, has the Seinfeld popping thing in the background. I'd like to give a final shout out to the saxophone, which established itself early on as the trademark sound of all of Sam's adventures. Speaking of trademarks, for those of you unfamiliar with the games made by Humongous, one of their staples are things called click points, little hotspots in the game's backgrounds that can be clicked on to activate little animations. This sort of feature already goes way beyond what is found in the average game, but Humongous games are notorious for featuring an absurd amount of these click points. I'm talking several variations of the same click point on a screen filled with dozens of other click points in a game with over 50 screens. This one doormat has a ridiculous six different animations drawn for it. There's even some that work together in tandem. Look how wonderfully weird some of these animations are. I was able to ask a little bit about these click points, and what I learned is that making them was actually an entry-level job for an artist at Humongous back in the day. And based on what ended up making it into the game, it was probably a pretty fun entry-level job. This man is so fancy. Do you like my chin? No. This is an angry cheese man. I float and I think and I think and I think about walking or driving a car or riding a bike and I think and I float because I'm just a brain in a jar. Someone actually explain this one to me because I hate it. I, I actually hate this one. 
But now it's time to stop dicking around because we came here for one reason. And that reason was to defeat the guy who lives in this awesome treehouse. Before we can get in, however, we need to solve a physics puzzle to operate the least practical front door I have ever seen. Who does this help? It's so bad that a six-year-old managed to break into your house, Darkness. The house contains a good selection of rooms to explore, each with their own little theme. The living room has a bunch of furniture having a great time at a dance party. That is, until you try and join in. Seeing this in the game brings back a lot of memories. Alright! He's gone! Man, I can't believe prom was only like two years ago. The next room over is the kitchen, which may just be the most ambitious room in the entire game. Everything you click on causes a musical number. Although shortly I'll be chewed, nevertheless I must conclude. And for a game that takes place in the land of darkness, that is quite possibly the darkest thing in this game. Upstairs we have two wooden doors who block the way to the rest of the house with a game show called The Brain Tickler. The Brain Tickler is one of the best designed elements in this entire game, and it's the opposite of why you'd expect, so let me explain. Normally, I'd criticize a game show segment like this, because like I've gone over, it's not a great way to teach kids. They either know the answer or they don't. In this case, however, about a third of the questions accept all answers to be true. So regardless of whether or not a player had any idea of what the right answer was, making them think they guessed correctly will make them more likely to remember that little bit of trivia than if they guessed the right answer in a question like this. Is it that important for kids to know the exact number, or just that it was really, really expensive? A question like that would be like something you see on a test in school. The purpose of a test isn't to teach you, it's to verify that you've been learning. But in a case like this, when all the answers are correct, it's no longer a test, it's a lesson in disguise. It's sneaky. The fourth and final question of the game, the one based on the Land of Darkness, is a clever way to regulate the pace of the game, necessitating you explore other parts of the world first before continuing on into some key areas. This ensures players can't rush through the game since only one out of the six possible item locations can be accessed without the help of items hidden beyond the brain tickler. After unlocking the rest of the house, you are led to a hallway with some of the weirdest click points in the entire game. Pardon? Excuse me. Pardon me. Sorry. In addition to the fancy music room with this talking Beethoven bust, you finally found the other side of that one-way door in the mines earlier. This area also provides a good lesson on spatial awareness, with a rotating secret door standing in between you and a fancy magnet. This part can be confusing as a kid until you realize that you can just go back through the house's front door to find the magnet waiting for you on the other side. Now at this point, if you haven't noticed, the game has some pretty stellar voice acting and writing. Ranging from soft and carrying to goofy and intimidating, the voice performances really sell the oftentimes self-aware and clever script like this mailbox who eventually gives in and lets you look at Darkness's mail. Oh, all right, here you go. Darkness may already have won a fabulous million dollar prize. Yeah, right. Or how each of these three torches has a distinct personality, despite almost exclusively talking about how they're on fire. Have I mentioned that I really love this job? I feel lightheaded. I hate being a candle. And my personal favorite character, the Wishing Well. You can call me Cal Nibonics. Where'd you get a name like that? I didn't say it was my name. I just said you could call me that. Or should I say the Swishing Well because you just got dunked on, motherfucker? All of those examples are to illustrate just how adult this game can get sometimes. One of the qualities I value most for any children's media is just how universally enjoyable it is. In other words, can someone twice my current age get as much out of this as five-year-old me could? As it turns out, the games were in fact made with the assumption that adults would be playing them too. A lot of the humor works on two levels. What was once a silly gag about a cash register stealing your newfound riches actually turns out to be an IRS joke when you're older. Lines of dialogue that seemed inconsequential as a kid take on a type of dark humor when heard through adult ears. Hi, how you doing? Pretty good. How about you? I can't complain. That's good. It's against the rules. Oh. Jokes like this go a long way to broaden the appeal of this game, and as Tom Very put it, never underestimate a good sense of humor. Speaking of dark humor, we have a monster to go shove in our lunchbox. You were so busy waltzing around the man's house that you probably forgot. He's been hanging out in his bedroom while well, you started a revolution in his kitchen and read his mail. He is almost certainly and justifiably pissed. As if Sam didn't have enough reasons to be afraid to begin with. At least with our mask, flashlight, and lunchbox beside us, we stand a fighting chance. The game does a really good job of hyping up this final encounter. If it weren't for the game's title spoiling the ending, you might actually think that Sam was going to walk into an epic battle. Another good bit of foreshadowing is something said by the grandfather clock. Don't tell me, let me guess. You're here to defeat darkness, right? How did you know that? Seen it before, boy. You mean I'm not the first one? Oh, heavens no. Oh. But like I said earlier, not all problems have to be solved with combat. Sometimes, it's best to defuse a situation with snacks. In the end, it turns out that Darkness wasn't such a bad guy after all. He just wanted some friends to play with. 
Why would you want to put me in a box? So I won't have to be scared of you anymore? You're scared? I'm the one who's going to be stuck in the box. Oh dear, no one ever wants to come over and play fun games with me. You like to play games? Yes, but I never have anyone to play with. At night, when I come out, everybody's asleep. Now this next part is mostly conjecture, but you can clearly see that the design of Darkness's room, inside and outside, matches up with Sam's pretty darn well. And it's not that far of a stretch to imagine that the rest of Darkness's house is pretty similar to Sam's as well, with a kitchen, living room, and study. I'd even go as far to argue that the living room, with all the dancing furniture, acts as a stand-in for Sam's parents, trying to have fun with their friends while he's asleep at night. The other big hint are the washer and dryer in the mines, as well as all the random water pipes. How much would you bet that Sam's basement has something similar? And if you remember where we entered the Land of Darkness, it had a street sign with Sam's name on it. Now where have we seen that before? In short, the Land of Darkness isn't some far off place Sam entered via his closet. It's his house. His neighborhood. Only we're seeing them through the lens of Sam's frightened six-year-old imagination. Darkness is just an imaginary monster who eventually becomes an imaginary friend. Part of why the Pajama Sam games stuck with me is because they weren't grounded in reality. They were reflections of reality warped and changed by the mind of a kid like Sam. A kid not unlike myself at that age. Now I do want to clarify that I'm a big fan of all the series made by Humongous, not just Pajama Sam. Pup Pot and I traveled to the moon, zoo, and through space and time itself on many different occasions. I helped solve mysteries with Freddy Fish and Luther, and I was instrumental in stopping Napoleon LaRoche from conquering the world more than a few times. But still, Pajama Sam remains my favorite out of the four flagship Humongous series. Now to be fair, a little bit of it has to do with the age I was when I started playing these games. These days I get a lot more enjoyment out of the Spy Fox series because I can fully appreciate all the seriously clever scenarios and writing that was geared for older audiences. But the reason I give Pajama Sam the edge is its central concept. Spy Fox is a spy. He saves the world. Putt Putt is a car. He goes places. Freddy is a fish who loves to solve mysteries. And Sam is a kid who's afraid of the dark. Which of those four do you relate to the most? Here's a better question. Which of those four do you think makes a better Halloween costume? If at this point you still feel that I haven't justified why I genuinely cherish a video game for 5 to 8 year olds, I don't know what else I can say. It's inspired, it's funny, it's smart, and it still looks and sounds spectacular. And this one isn't even my favorite. Hello, hi, how are you? Um, my name is Kevin, and I made the video you just watched. This was the first in a series I'm making on the entire Pajama Sam series, so I'm gonna cover all the games. Expect more videos at a later date. So not now. I would also like to take a moment to once again thank the people who worked on the game for putting up with my questions. Like, wow, they made this video way better than it had any right to be, so I really want to thank them for that. They were all really friendly and helpful and in general just really fun to talk to, so thank you once again. If you wanted to try some humongous games for yourself, they're all on Steam right now, and I got like my uh, Pajama Sam collection in a bundle, so they're pretty cheap that way. I would highly recommend giving them at least a try. And if you are still alive at this point, then please check out the other nonsense I have devoted my free time to because it would justify my existence. Yeah, so now I'm gonna go sleep the rest of my life away because I don't even know how I'm alive sometimes. Bye.